Okay, we are live with um, what appears to be one of our most popular um, webinars. And we're doing it as well because so many people have said to us, um, can you do something on imposter syndrome? And every other webinar we talk about, with, uh, with whatever women we have in it, who are all amazing and seriously successful, in anything they do, imposter syndrome comes up every time we have a chat and you're talking about talk, we're talking to amazing women who have achieved amazing things and imposter syndrome's in there and it's just it's incredible how much of a massive thing it is in everyone um and we've joined today by three really really cool human beings three of some of my favorite people um zoe clues who in the last year especially not then i've got to know zoe and she's all gonna launch this feel good rooms with sort of mental health in lockdown and Zoe Clees and Associates, big Harley Street um, set up, hypnotherapy, specialising in every kind of mental health um, issue, PTSD, trauma, imposter syndrome, whatever, you name it. Um, for over 20 years, she's been doing it. And then Sarah Porter, who I've known for over a decade, um, who is one of the most amazing women in tech, CEO of Inspired Mind, runs the big global AI summit. I mean, you look at her on paper and LinkedIn and you think that is some serious badass shit going on um, and fighting in a very male industry um, um, and has lots of stories on imposter syndrome. And I thought it would be an amazing person. And then Sanjita Fly, who we've had chats, um, founder activist and founder of Soul Sutures, South Asian net feminist network just talking about taboos and especially when it comes to sort of sexuality within the Asian culture and the doors you've slammed open and had slammed in your face and the personal sort of journey you've had to deal with to get where you are. Um, yeah, it's another unbelievable inspiring inspiring female <laughs> to have in this um in this lineup. But what we're gonna do to start with is just Zoe's just gonna um share Kind of what is imposter syndrome because there is that kind of well what is it and a lot of people don't recognize it and they think it's just them doubting themselves and their shit and they shouldn't be doing what they're doing and when you realize it's actually a thing it's easier to kind of deal with and bash that voice in, in your head isn't it so i'll hand over i'll hand over to zoe um, thank you thank you Emma. it's great to be here i'll just start by saying a few words about it you know it's so rife imposter syndrome um i treat it loads um i speak to so many people who have it and actually in fact, the more successful you can become, the worse it, it worse it can get because it feels like this polarised thing. People are responding to you being really successful or having all these things apparently together and inside you're, you're feeling um, a lot different. So I'm going to share something, which is a bit of an infographic that I made, um, which basically demonstrates what imposter syndrome is. OK, so can we all see that? So, okay, this is a bit of a, a psychological model of what imposter syndrome is, what I think it is. So, if we go right back to the beginning, we're born a bit of a blank slate. Obviously, we can't remember it, we're infants, um, but we feel okay and, you know, we're, we're quite neutral. Now, what happens is we all go through negative experiences. You know, some people's experiences might be more severe than others. Some people will have severe and complex uh, trauma because of what they've gone through. Um, other, but we'll, you know, other people might have um, just an experience where they weren't fully met by their mum or dad, or we've all, we've all gone through difficult things. We might be bullied at school, we might have heartbreak, we also can also go through adverse experiences as an adult. Now, what happens is, is when we go through these negative experiences, especially if we're small, we've all had some stuff, you know, we doesn't mean we're all traumatized, but some of us are really traumatized, but some of us, we've all had difficult things that we've gone through. Now, if we go through them, especially up until the age of nine, what happens is, is we sort of split off from who we really are. And there's something called the collapse self. And we've all got a bit of it. It's a bit of us, it's, it's a bit of us that's vulnerable. So, this trauma or negative impact or this heartbreak or this divorce or this bullying or whatever it was, mum criticising your body or whatever the thing was, and there's a myriad of issues it can be, it sort of creates a split in us, which is called the collapsed self. That's just, and, and that's the part of us that thinks, these are the classics, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve this, that, the other, I'll never meet anyone. I'm unworthy, I'm defective, there's something wrong with me. There can be milder versions of that as well, which is just kind of just being a bit down on ourselves, thinking I can't do it. These are the kind of, this is the narrative that the inner critic or the superego comes out with. And it's always really a real, as we, this 
um, collapsed self is always this from this place is where we tend to compare ourselves to others, what I call the compare and despair. So we look at someone else and we think they've got it all together, you know, but we're, we're looking at the outside of them. We're not always looking, we're not looking at how they feel inside, but we can be, you know, and this can be a real problem in today's age, you know, we're comparing ourselves to Instagram, Instagram models, blah, 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 blah. Um, so this collapsed self, this place that we come from, is often full of shame. You know, we don't want people to see this part of us. We feel vulnerable here. And we have this trend of this feeling that it's not good enough. So what we do, because we don't want anyone to see this, is we think, okay, I don't want any society to see this. So we create, if you like, what's called the mask. Now, some of this is sort of genuine drive. Like we want to be successful, we want to be happy, we want good things to happen in our life. And that stuff is great and that's wonderful. But what we can do is put this pressure on ourselves to be perfect. So we create this mask for society. You know, for example, I'm going to be extremely successful. I'm going to have the perfect life. And we can get hooked up, especially as women, in perfectionism. So what happens then is that people respond to this mask. This is what society sees. So we might see somebody really successful, really polished. We think they've got it all together. Um, or we compliment them on their career, et cetera, et cetera. But this person who's receiving this um, unconditional positive regard, if you like, from people isn't really feeling like that. They're feeling like this. They're feeling like the collapsed self. And that is where imposter syndrome comes in. So somebody might be saying to you, oh, aren't you great? You've got it all together or it's brilliant. You, you, you've got into this position or look at all this amazing work you've done. But you're still coming from this place of potential trauma or vulnerability um, and not feeling good enough. So that is where imposter syndrome comes in because people are responding to what they can see and we are responding from how we feel inside. Now, what we have to do in order to sort of heal, this is one of the things about healing imposter syndrome, is really, it's about, it's about integration. It's about understanding that we do have these vulnerable parts of ourselves, that these beliefs that we came to ourselves um, as a version, as, as, a, as a result of negative experiences aren't true they're just their feelings they're not beliefs um and it's also about understanding that we're all of these things we are you know okay we are vulnerable we also can show up and do well um because when we start to feel bad what we can tend to do is go into this place of oh, i've got to be perfect I've, I've got to work harder, I've got to do more, I've got to be more. And then we come away from self-acceptance and we go back into that imposter syndrome place because I don't know if any of you've noticed, I noticed it with myself, I noticed it with clients that I work with and friends, that we can get caught up in this trap when we don't feel good enough and we're feeling imposter syndrome is I've got to do more, I've got to achieve more. And then we get more exhausted and it sends us back into the collapsed self. So really what we want to do to heal imposter syndrome is bring a lot of acceptance to ourselves, probably work through those negative experiences that we went through. The subconscious doesn't understand time. Um, we can have gone through something when we're 10, like say being bullied at being school, and we can think, oh, that was 20, 40 years ago. Um, what we don't realize is that the subconscious, there's no time, it still holds on to that. So those beliefs that we um, came to about ourselves as a result of having negative experiences of being bullied still stand. They still kind of insidiously affect most of what we do causing imposter syndrome. So it's about healing what we've gone through, looking what we've gone through. Also realizing that when we're in this sort of collapsed place of not feeling good enough, we don't have to race to get back to feeling good. We can just sit and have a cup of tea with our feelings and go, today I feel a bit crappy, today I feel like this. It's just a feeling, it's not actually who I am. Um, so, and take the pressure off ourselves to be perfect and recognize that we do good things, we've achieved a lot, or, you know, sometimes we want to achieve more, but we want to do it from a place of kind of wholeness rather than beating ourselves up with a stick because the superego, also known as the inner critic, can get really, 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 really harsh. And this feeling of shame of not being good enough can drive us further and further and further. And we all know people, that no matter how much they've achieved, no matter how much they've done, still feel not good enough inside. And what we want to do is work through the negative experiences, try and, and we're looking to return to that feeling of, I'm okay just as I am. I can achieve good things, but I'm more than that. And actually it's bringing, it's kind of like wholeness and reintegration. Does that make sense? I've sort of waffled on quite a lot there. No, it's good. It was, um, it was a good, um, it was a good little sort of overview. 
yes. um, of, of it and where and where it comes from. And I think now I'll yeah, I'm, I'm ask um, the other two because a lot of people, everyone's in really different situations doing really different things with really different backgrounds. Um, and it's when you don't know that it's a thing, it's yeah. if you just, you then think you're shit and you shouldn't, why are people asking you to do something? I get it the whole time. Like when you ask to do a talk or something, and I'm like, before I go on, I'm like, why am I doing it? Why does anyone give a shit what I have to say? And they're going to look at me and go, who does she think she is up there? <laughs> it's, it's there all the time. I think, you know what I mean? It hasn't got any better the older I've got. That's for sure. Uh -huh. And like Sarah, so Sarah, on your, in your experience, and like, you know, the more successful you become as well, um, how do you, yeah, what's your experience with it? I mean, firstly, sorry, what you said was incredible. There were so many aha moments for me. I was like, really? Oh my God. <laughs> we should have met like 10 years ago. You've solved so many problems for me. <laughs> so, so, from my point of view, I have always been a, a woman in senior leadership. I was at board level in a, in a media company where I was the only woman on that board. Um, and I found myself surrounded by people that I couldn't associate with. And I think for me that was a big part of imposter syndrome is the fact that I was always a minority and I was a minority in the peer group that I was working with. Um, so I found myself in a situation where I would continually uh, compare myself to the people that were around me. But the majority of them were white, confident men. And confidence is the key word thing. I think they you know, owe to have the confidence of a middle-aged white man, I was going to say. Um, and those people that I was surrounded by would stereotype me and play to the voice that I already, and the doubts that I already had in my head, if that makes sense. So some of the things that I would, throughout, I'll give you some examples. I was told at a board meeting where I was leading the acquisition of a 140 million pound company that uh, I was there to take the minutes. Two minutes before the meeting, I was asked if I was going to put some heels on. You know, I was asked if I was there. At another meeting, I was asked if I do I have any red lipstick because there's a really important client coming in. And these are the types of things, like from the systems that exist at the moment and the people that you're surrounded with, that I think reinforce those negative thoughts that you may already have. So I think that, that was the first thing for me. I fell out of that company in a really bad way, as Emma knows, and I then decided to. I couldn't change the system, so I was actually going to recreate the system, which is why I created the business that I was in, which was, okay, look, you're not going to accept me as a woman in business. You're not going to accept me as a woman in tech. You're not going to take me seriously, and you're going to continue to oppress me. And uh, therefore, I'm going to create my own system where I'm going to empower myself to do what I need to do. So that's how I started setting up Inspired Minds. Unfortunately, the business that I'm in now, which is tech and artificial intelligence, it's, there's only 16% of people that are women. Um, and of those 16% of people that are um, in AI right now, I think only 5% of them receive VC funding. So I'm back in that minority group. So my imposter syndrome is like continually alarm bells going off, evil claw in my head, as I call it, telling me, you don't belong here, you're a minority, you're going to fail. Um, but I've now got a lot of coping strategies that I use to deal with that. And what do you, what, what do you found work? Yeah, yeah. No, go on. Tell us um, what are some of the big ones in your yam that you use? So, so many things. Um, I mean, there. Are, so, I think the first thing are the very simple things and the go-to things, which are the recognizing, accepting the fact that the voice that is in your head is a voice of experiences that have happened to you, and identifying that and seeing that as I call it, my evil claw, which is almost like something in my brain. You know, I. I created one of the biggest world uh, summits on artificial intelligence. I didn't believe I'd managed to create that until the morning that it opened and there were 16 and a half thousand people sitting in the audience and I was crying in the loo. You know, like, oh, <laughs> I can't go out there. Well, who are these people? What are they doing here? Um, and for me, it was about uh, telling myself, okay, you deserve to be here. You have a right to be here and you are just going to have to face your fears and get out there and, and get your big pants on, as you say, and, and walk out on that stage. But some of the mechanisms that I've used is a thing called fear setting. So, um, so I'm, I'm visualization, I'm a big fan of visualization and meditation states that bring around visualization so that it's actually real. So I will visualize something in finite detail and, and it can't be just a positive affirmation of, okay, this is gonna work and I'm gonna create this. It's what's the music that is playing in the background when this becomes something real? What's the coffee taste like that I drink as I, before I go onto the stage? What are the looks on the people's faces that are there? 
and visualizing that so much. And then I repeat and play that over and over and over in my head until that becomes the new message. And it works because suddenly you realize that what you visualize becomes reality. Um, and I find for me that that gets rid of a lot of the, the kind of things that hold me back. And fear setting is, okay, look, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of being a woman CEO. I'm terrified that I'm going to fuck this up. I'm going to get it wrong. Um, but what does that really look like? And when you go down that route of setting out all of those fears that you're facing and what's the absolute worst that can happen, and then I play those out in my mind, you realize actually, you know, it's not that bad. You know, I'm, am I going to die from this? Maybe, but is that so bad? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you kind of realize that actually the worst fear that you're facing is really not all that bad. And fear setting for me has been a really valuable goal. Um, I mean, there's loads of others, loads and loads of others, but I don't want to take over and go on. What do you say, Zoe, on, um, because that there's more and more, I hear more and more, and that's what I've noticed like in the talks, people like Sarah. So you get people on who are the top at what they do, and it's they, that voice in the head seems to get worse as you get more successful. Yeah. And that more, they're all, they're, we're going to be found out tomorrow and people are going to realize, realize that we're literally talking horseshit and yeah. have no idea <laughs> what, um, what do you, do you find that? And like, what, yeah, what, what do you say? Yeah, I think, that? I think that in a way the, the, I guess the, the bigger you get, the bigger risks you take, there's always going to be some fear, isn't it? I mean, you know, I always say, uh, courage isn't an absence of fear an absence of fear is being brain dead we're always gonna um have some fear so when you're when you're stepping forward that inner the persecutory superego i call it the inner critic or the monk in the back whatever you want to call it, it it will start screeching louder the most important thing is to to go ahead and do it anyway i think there's some really good techniques i loved what you love how you used um them sarah and you talked about bringing in um kind of the the other senses and stuff so i think that's really powerful because affirmations can just be a bit flimsy i think they can just sit on top you can sit there and say to yourself hey i'm feeling really confident but at the time of your heart's pounding and you're like sweat is running down your back you know it's not cutting the mustard is it so i think to start bringing in things where you visualize yourself um being able to do that and i think a lot of this is about self-talk i think it's sort of two parts so um, with the inner critic, and this is, again, this is a lifetime's work. The superego, you know, most therapists, psycho psychologists, psychotherapists will say the same thing. It's a real bugger. Trying to get, you can get it down, you can get it down, um, but it is a lot of work and probably quite a lot of daily practice as well. One of the most powerful things is you can do is just tell it to F off when it starts up. You know, as soon as you hear it, just get actually get angry with it and imagine it's like if someone was walking around saying to you what it's you say to yourself you'd have knocked them out years ago wouldn't you you know you can't do that with yourself so you've just got to, you've got to get really firm and sometimes i just say to it not today satan because it will <laughs> go <laughs> about anything and if you're tired or you're hungover or you're stressed it will be really loud you know the more rested you are i think the quieter it is um but you know we're all under enormous stress and we have been for a very long time so i think one of the ways to deal with it is to get angry with it and the other way to deal with it is i have a technique which i quite like called having sitting having a cup of tea with your feelings you have to make time for that one but you know realize okay i feel really nervous about this and it's a bit like self-parenting like you talk to your own child but you do it with yourself okay I've, I've created this thing i feel out of my depth i can't believe i'm doing it is everyone going to think this is everyone and actually people don't they generally like wow well done for being so brave and innovative aren't they but um I think the most important thing we can do is look after ourselves, a bit of self-parenting, which sounds really self-indulgent, but actually it's a great technique. It's a lovely way to treat yourself. Sit and have a cup of tea with your feelings and go, okay, I'm really scared. I feel really nervous. All this shame's come up because I'm worried about being exposed. But realise their feelings. They're usually feelings that are old. We're often afraid of what's already happened. Maybe we were shamed or exposed as a kid in some way. Most have had, have had that experience through, I know, teachers saying, What's the answer to this question? You don't know it. And things like that pop up. So it's talking to yourself and saying, you know, you've got these feelings. Ha have a cup of tea with your feelings. And realise that they're feelings and not facts as well. So I think it's about self-parenting and also getting really quite aggressive with the superego. Like, mm. I shut up all the time. Yeah. Because it will yeah. really look up. And I've got mine down. But, it, it, you know, it used to be my inner critic was, oh, it was damning. It was poleaxing. You know, I've done a lot of work on getting mine down. And, you know, when I first started as a hypnotherapist, 
my the imposter syndrome that I had was so bad because I'd just been this party girl that was quite rebellious. So everyone was like, what, you're being a hypnotherapist? Five people laughed in my face. I can only imagine how many people laugh behind my back. So I felt so anxious setting up as a hypnotherapist. I wouldn't even use my real name. So it's kind of like, but you push through it, don't you? You push through it. And if you push through it sometimes enough, it does start to quieten down. But um, So there's also that, feeling the fear and do it anyway. But I think, yeah, working on a daily basis, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, doing it all the time. Healing anything that's underneath it is always a good thing to do. A lot of the time we've got a really strong inner critic of unprocessed grief and also using that self-parenting technique. They're my sort of go-tos. But I still yeah. get it. You know, it still goes, still rises up like molten lava sometimes. Like, oh my god, what I'm going to do this? But uh, it's um, it's more manageable. Isn't it? Sorry, yeah. having on, the, on the, I was about to say the mo when when you said about they're telling it to fuck off. I have a yeah. thing is uh, uh, a bottle of I don't give a fuck. Yeah, um, and there's and, and that you take a shot of that before anything. And you, there is a moment that you get to, I think, where you realise that actually I just don't give a fuck. You know, judge me. <laughs> Say what you want, do what you like. I, don't, I really don't give a fuck. And if you could bottle that and give that to younger women, I think, particularly at the moment, that would be really bloody useful is give everybody a bottle of I don't give a fuck and take a shot of it. <laughs> <laughs> it I, 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 have, I have little people in my head and it, it's what you said. It's, it's not trying to get rid of it and getting really angry because they're not going anywhere. It's yeah. I say I have little people that live in my head and they're there the whole time. And sometimes one might get a bit gobby and I tell it to sit the fuck down. You know, and I call it giving a good bitch slap. It's sort of a go and sit at the back. You're not needed in my life right now. It, but it's knowing that they're there and, and living with them and actually becoming friends with them and going, there's yeah. fear, there's imposter syndrome, there's, you know, it's still of all these people or yeah. resentment. We've all got jealousy and resentment in us. Again, we're never going to, that's their natural feelings that will be there. That, so they've all, all, I just call them all these little people that are in there. Yeah, that like I've committee. learned to live with. And, yeah. committee in the but, head. Yeah. Exactly. But Sandy, so you've got, your background's incredible. And like what you, what you have come through to get to where you are and fighting. Um, now, just tell us, yeah, just t tell us the, like the story of where, of your, of your background and the story to get to, yeah, what your business now and launching Soul Sutures. So imposter syndrome for me is really real. It's a big part of me and it's something I struggle with all the time. So even yesterday I was on a panel and I was hearing someone talk about, oh, you've, how have you done these amazing things? And I have this feeling of like, are they talking about me? So, you know, I have this constant feeling. Uh, and I know where it comes from. I've done a lot of work on myself. I grew up in India. I grew up in a slum in Mumbai. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic, he was abusive, so there was a lot of trauma and a lot of fear in, in me as a child. So I didn't really have a childhood. Um, so I know that a lot of these feelings of kind of um, unworthiness or, you know, all of these really complicated things come from there. Then you add to that the layer of being South Asian. So as a South Asian woman, you know, we're not really allowed space to talk. If there's a room, if, I don't know, if you go into a traditional house, the men sit in one room and the women sit in the kitchen. You know, so that tells you kind of the spaces we're allowed to occupy. Mm -hmm. um, so already you're kind of like, oh, can I speak? Can, can I, you know, say please and sorry and this and that. So there's cultural baggage. There's baggage from my kind of childhood and life. So it's something I really struggle with. And I think a big part of um, building the business for Soul Sutras for the last three years now, has been going ahead despite the fear. I think it's something that maybe Zoe, you said, that you feel the fear and you feel like, do I belong here and can I say this? But it's doing it anyway. And again, the, 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 the spaces I've chosen to occupy, podcasting, white, middle-class, Oxford, Cambridge accents, right? Audio, pretty much that. Everybody on BBC sounds, nobody sounds like me, right? So then how do I then say that I have the right to have a voice here um, on kind of audio panels that I sit on? I'm often the only, you know, brown woman. Well, by um, now. <laughs> yeah. That's the example. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't happen. So the point I want to make is, so not only is this imposter syndrome something that I suffer from, I know that a lot of women in my community do because if you've never been given a voice, then it's very difficult to stand up and say, I have this thing I really need to say. It's really, really hard. Um, historically, and again, in British media, British society, 
where I think 7% of the population, but how many South Asian women do you see on TV, on media? You know, very few in positions of power. We're all, you know, I always joke and say, we're the terrorist wife or we're like the corner shop guys, whatever, <laughs> sister, you know, and that's it. So then it becomes really, really complicated. So the things coming back to kind of what I try and do is try and remind myself. And just this afternoon, it's so funny that we're having this panel today. This afternoon, I sat down and I said, wrote the sentence in my little book to say, I've done all of these things in the last three years, but somewhere in me, there's a feeling of not being worthy or something like that, because it's, it's a constant struggle. And then what I do to kind of counter that is I make a list of um, I literally made a list this afternoon of all the things I've done in two years, and they're incredible. You know, I look at it in black and white on a sheet of paper, and I say, oh, my God, I started a podcast without any idea what a podcast was. I won a British Podcast Award. My podcast was on I May Destroy You, one of the biggest shows of last year, you know, and so on. So I literally make a list, and then it's in black and white, and then even my, what was it you said, your super ego. Yeah. You can't say that none of that happened. It did, you yeah. know? So that's how I work around it. But I, you know, I won't be, I won't lie. It is something I struggle with all the time. And do you get on, on that and make, you, you make the list so you can, you know what you've achieved, but then do you get the voice in you thinking, oh, everyone thinks I'm like Mr. Miss Billy Big Balls for, you know, yeah. saying I've won this and I've done that and I'm a CEO. And like, I hate the yeah. word entrepreneur. I think it sounds like an absolute ass. I've never had that title. I don't like it. I think, oh my God, people think I'm a wanker if I say I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, what a twat. Um, do you get, you know, when oh when God, you're putting yeah. all the things down, do you think people are going to look at me and go, wow, she's full of herself? You know, the other, exactly that. Again, culturally, that's very complicated for us in South Asian culture. So we are taught as children that other people need to praise us. We can never praise ourselves because that makes us big headed. So your mom will always say, don't talk you know, about yourself. Oh, look, auntie so-and-so said something about you. So you know, that's how we're brought up. So to even say something that, oh, I did X, Y, and Z, feels wrong, like feels wrong in the body. I put up this post on Instagram, uh, I think last week, I had this shot on the beach and it, you know, it was me in a swimsuit. And I wrote the same thing. You know, I think I look amazing, but even as I write this, I cringe inside. The words make me cringe. Like my body feels uncomfortable saying that because it's that ingrained in us to not say I'm amazing. You know, it's just so, so, so difficult. How do you get around that, you know? Yeah, Zoe, what are you going to have on um, actually, you know, talking yourself out? <laughs> yeah, yourself. well, I think it's kind of, I think we've got to be really kind to ourselves about it as well, you know, because if we've always, if we've been brought up as well um, to, um, We've been brought up and you know it, there's been loads of trauma there's been loads of stuff there's just or just there's just been something and it can be really hard to accept compliments so you can say to somebody you look great and they go oh no, 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 no this whole thing you know <laughs> about themselves and it's kind of it's sometimes you just it's about practicing just receiving just going thank you i had to do that people would give me compliments and i'd be like and then try and push it away and then just receiving thank you and now i can do it and i think you need to be really kind with yourself about the process when there's been all this complex trauma and all these layers that you talk about sin and jita you know it is this process of healing that's like takes a long time and it's about realizing we've got all these little wounded inner children within us that believe these really awful things about themselves and also and we we, we carry a lot of shame and it wasn't our shame to carry um I came from a black background with complex PTSD as well, which is why I specialise in it. Um, you know, so I can relate to some of what you're talking about, but it's kind of like, I understand the importance of being able to um, just be able to look after those sort of parts of ourselves, work through it, begin to heal it. And, and as that happens, some of that old stuff drops away because a lot of the time we're not carrying just what we've gone through. We're carrying what our parents went through. We're carrying a lot of other people's shame. We're carrying um, the, any of our caregivers or the people that we grew up around, or school teachers, or whatever, you know, we went through. So we're carrying all this stuff. So it's a process. So I think we need to be gentle with ourselves and just notice sometimes to bring some awareness to it and go, oh, I'm doing that thing again where um, I'm, you know, someone's 
and, and given me some really great praise or some really great feedback or some fantastic acknowledgement of what I've gone through or what I've, I've achieved or gone through or overcome in the face of adversity and I'm just throwing it away and just bringing a little bit of like I need to do something a bit better that next time with it I'm going to let myself allow a bit more of that in and realize and be kind to ourselves about it and realize well we um you know we're not used to doing that we know we're not used to doing that and also being kind to ourselves when we do do something like put up a post where we look great going i think i look great oh my god i'm cringing at the same time and by admitting your vulnerability about it it's okay isn't it you know it's kind of like i do this and and also by that because by doing that we're accepting both parts of ourselves the part of ourselves that is sort of stepping out but the part of ourselves that still feels a bit collapsed and not good enough and that's when we're sort of becoming a bit more whole um and i know what you mean emma about the entrepreneur thing people say that sometimes about me and i'm like Oh, I don't know if I am an entrepreneur, and I feel a bit 80s if someone says entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. If you had, you have that, Sarah, doing that because you know you've you've sort of achieved so much in every year, you're doing more and more, and up for awards, and like you know, female tech entrepreneur and everything like that. Is that do you get do you, the more you do, the more you think, yeah, people are sort of looking at you, going, "Wow, she rates herself." <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I have a shot of I don't give a fuck. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, you do. What I find really helps actually is, and you talk about the more you become successful, is the more you do things, the more you practice it, you're flexing that muscle. So it's almost like you're building a resilience to that inner critic. Um, and one of the things that I found really made a difference for me is tackling those things and embracing them as challenges. And I know that sounds cheesy because you might be absolutely shocking yourself and thinking, God, I really don't want to do this. But if you can manage to change the way you think about things, so that it, there's a really good book on this actually by Ryan Holiday called "The Obstacle Is the Way." Um, Sorry, I read, I read it at the beginning of last lockdown, April. Yeah, yeah. Really good, isn't it? Really, really good. good. Yeah, really good. A lot of stoicism. In it. Yeah, a lot of stoicism and a lot about how you can choose how you want to react to any given situation. All of those sorts of things, which are just good, I think, coping mechanisms for being a for me for being a business leader anyway. But one of the things that I found from that is actually, I'm the type of person that likes to challenge myself. And I'm also the type of person that wants to do, I want to see systemic change in tech. I wanna see more women in tech. I wanna see the things that I've experienced change for my daughters. And I think if you're trying to make systemic change, you have to accept the fact that you're gonna get haters, you're gonna get negativity, you're gonna get naysayers, you're gonna get people that project their fears and insecurities onto you. And that takes a hell of a lot of resilience to be able to continue on that path of I want to stand up to that and make that change. So for me, sometimes it's making sure that I can differentiate between, okay, is this something actual and should I be concerned? And is that really something that I should be questioning myself on? Or is this because I am actually challenging other people here to change things that is an oppressive system or seeing, you know, we flew in the all girl Afghan rob robotics team after they were banned by Donald Trump onto our stages. And some people really took offense to that. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, this is, this is what we're going to do. It's change. So I think, so for me, I partly over time have learned to embrace the things that really scare me um, and then reward myself when I manage to achieve them. And that reward can be something as really trivial and silly as, do you know what, I've, I'm, I actually deserve to go and buy myself some aromatherapy, whatever it is, or something or other. You know, it's like these little mechanisms that I used to say, yes, actually, you were scared shitless, you managed to do this, everything told you that you weren't going to be able to do it. When you did it, then you rewarded yourself. And it builds res resilience and muscle towards that imposter voice that's in your head. And, and that, for me, is been over probably over the last 10 years to the point now where I've I had this feeling and it which is if as long like you can fail numerous times as an imposter you know and you can tell yourself you're going to fail numerous times but the point where I feel if I really fail will be that I choose to quit and I think when you get to that point you can feel like an imposter but all of the time if you like tackle that with I don't care if I fail that's okay and I don't give a fuck then actually mm -hmm. You, you find resilience and ways to learn to, to just cope with it and crack on. Yeah, I think that that give a give a fuck and you know I always say I don't care what they think, I don't care, and it was sounds really flippant, but actually the older I got, the more actually I'm unapologetic and no, I always say you know, and I joke about stuff, but I mean no shame and no, and it is that it's sort of you're not going to please everyone, and actually if they do look at 
you've posted something or have done something and there will be people that go oh my gosh you raised the self there will but i very quickly go but that's their resentment that's their insecurities yeah. uh, do i really deserve yeah. that um it's that yeah. backing yourself going no sod them that's in, and then you just feel sorry for them and go well that's on them that's yeah that's not that's not on me so is it but yeah, I think, let him, sorry, Sanjita, were you going to speak? Yeah, I was just going to add something. Something that really helps me, actually, is thinking of the bigger purpose of the work that I do. So the minute I'm able to go from individual Sangeeta to um, really helping South Asian women with the work that I do, and I think of what that is doing and how that affects and changes and transforms people's lives, I'm able to stop even if it's for five seconds or five minutes, just you know, sort of saying, "Oh, can I really do this?" Because it's not—it's not about me anymore. It's about a bigger purpose, yeah. and that really, really helps me. That's beautiful. Do you know what? It's interesting because I was going to say something similar. I was going to say, you know, it's about giving ourselves permission to be powerful, actually, as well, and powerful in a good way. Because we look at all of us we're all doing work, helping other women, helping other people. It's, it's inspiring. It's kind of, you know, I look at what you know. You know, because I know you, what you write and stuff like that. I actually find it really inspiring that I'm going to really care what anyone thinks. It's actually, and it helps other people speak up as well, you know, because it is inspiring when I read people's posts that say things like that. And I think um, we've probably been taught that power isn't a good thing, you know, from an early age, you know, that I was anyway. I was quite disempowered. So part of my path has been becoming empowered. And it's about giving ourselves permission to be powerful and realizing that actually, we can kind of get out of our own way a bit and we, the, the more visible we are doing it with good heart and good intentions then you know we're actually helping a lot more people because we can inspire other people and we can say especially if we've had struggles with adversity which all of us have is is um you know i can do it so can you it sort of lights the way doesn't it it's kind of and that helps that that does help soften the imposter syndrome thing because then it becomes less about oh i'm doing it to be a big show pony and more about I'm doing this to help people as well. And do you think on the um because there's the, I've seen more I've seen things because like imposter syndrome has become you know a big thing in the last few years. I see more and more stuff on it. But then I've seen the is it a, is it it's another excuse if that if is it a label that's been put on especially for women that kind of victim label of that's what's holding us back. You know, there's so many things that get put. Men don't have it. Well, men do yeah. get across the syndrome. I know that completely, but the label doesn't get put on them as much. You'd think it's a woman thing, but actually it's like the statistics, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the same, men, women. Um, but it's that how much do you think is it's an excuse that is put in quite a little controversial that are put on women as a sort of an excuse why they're not achieving things, why they're not getting the pay rises, why not? Oh, because, you know, there's this massive... It's just another excuse. Do you see that? Did that come out right? I don't know if I explained myself yeah, on Yeah, I, mean, I, I, get, I get people calling me saying, I've got imposter syndrome, can you help me with it? Because it's holding me back. So I do I do see that. Um, have I have I seen it being put on people as, uh, I don't know, because I'm more, I'm, more, I'm more working directly with people on it. So I see people who want to change it. What I do see is that sometimes, you know, um, Erica Young, my favorite writer, she always says that, women are trained to be uselessly nice so we can do this thing of being a bit of a people pleasing pretzel which is what I was for years you know <laughs> and um, just agreeing to anything and then that doesn't help with imposter syndrome either because it's just kind of feeding it because it's just it's holding yourself back and you're not really being your, your authentic self which is um, which imposter syndrome will tell you oh you know you can't do that you need to keep yourself small and nice and agreeable and all of those things and actually part of kind of working with imposter syndrome is coming out and going well I might have to upset a few people or to actually say I've got to say what I really feel and do what I really want and sometimes when you step out people don't like it as well that's what happens when they don't like it when you change identity or you suddenly or you grow or you shift but like you said Emma that's you know that's their stuff yeah, and on the and, and a lot of it's like is confidence because we've found um, like serving all our members and actually across Killing Kittens as well. So from bedroom, bedroom to boardroom, the what holds women back in general, the main thing is, is confidence. Yeah. Is that um, and that and all of us, you know, have said the same thing. It's it goes back to yay high, <laughs> um, and the and the messaging that we get and how much have you seen all of you in that 
yeah, I have it in my head of that you're too opinionated, you're too bossy, you're, people think you're too aggressive, you're too, you know, that it is, it's constantly sort of there and how you, like Sarah, I know you've had that, but how, how do you sort of overcome that kind of, the, the negativity attached to those, those things of being too bossy and too aggressive? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's unfortunately that people don't like change, right? And people don't, people like to be able to expect, to see what they expect of you. Um, and we're changing that as women, us, the four women that are here, we're, we're changing the expectation of what women's roles are. Um, and I think and some people will find that unpalatable. You know, some people just don't like it. And if I could count on, on one hand the number of times that people have said, actually, do you know what, that was over aggressive of you. And, and my response to that is, well, okay, now I'd like you to imagine that I'm Jeff, I'm 45, I'm white, and I'm a bloke. Would, would that, you know, would that be the same issue? Um, so I think, I think I think we're up against it because we have to modify our behaviour, or we're expected to modify our behaviour to fit into the environments that we're putting ourselves in, where we're a minority. And if we don't, and which I tend not to, I'm afraid, my 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 response is actually. I'm un unapologetically going to be me, and if you don't like it, that's your fucking problem, quite frankly. But we are expected to fit in and modify our behaviour to fit into what people want us to be. Um, so I think then it, one of the other things that I've noticed as well is in the groups of people that I'm working with is in artificial intelligence, particularly that comes down to stereotypes and unconscious biases. And unconscious biases are from throughout history, what our expectation of, of women and, and people of colour and gay people and all the rest of it is. And now we're changing that. AI has unfortunately already learned throughout history that that expectation is that women will, like the Burger King tweet yesterday, will be in the kitchen or whatever it was. You know, those stereotypes, for us to be able to shake those off is going to be really tough if AI recreates them. Um, so, so my role, I see partly, is to continually change the expectation of the system of what women should be doing, what people of colour should be doing by presenting that as the current reality. Um, and as a result of that, you do get put back and push back and people saying, as a female CEO, actually, you're, uh, you know, you're aggressive, you're overly aggressive, or you're, you're really overly confident. You know, I've sat in meetings with people where they told me that actually, you know, you're, you're way, you were way too aggressive in that meeting. I was like, well, I was negotiating the sale of a part of my business. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so yes, I think is the answer to that. And I think one of the other things as well is when it comes on to what you're doing, Emma, is you we need more role models and people around us. And I find that it's a lot of people don't want to come on that journey with you. And the more you actually change and you put yourself out there as this change that you want to see in the world, the more people are uncomfortable with that. And you have to you have to get comfortable with the fact that other people are not going to come with you. They're going to push back on that. Um, so that's why things like mentors and peer groups and being surrounded by people like you and sister is really important, I think. And Sanjita, have you had, you know, what you've done and in your culture is huge and the pushback must have been huge. And it's not, I'm not talking about men either. They kind of, the women, yeah. women around you and women in your culture and women like even family members and stuff of that, this is not how women are meant to be. Yeah. Have you seen? Yeah. Yeah, massively. It's um, huge. It's, hang on, not you, Sarah. Hang on, Sanjita. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you be quiet, woman. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. 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 So, women um, keep other women in boxes in in my culture, and it the way I think about it is the conditioning goes back so many generations that. Um, women do patriarchy's dirty work now, you know, because they've adopted the, the kind of mores of, of, of patriarchal structures, like women do this and men do that, and women are mothers and sisters and dutiful and all of the rest of it. So, yeah, it's very challenging to a lot of South Asian people. My very presence is very challenging. So it's like, so you're not married? No. You haven't got kids? No, I've chosen not to have them. I talk about sex for a living. So even that is deeply, it's like an affront to a lot of people. Uh, and women feel quite threatened by it too. So there are some women that are very supportive, but a lot of women aren't. So that's quite difficult. And not just within South Asian culture, what I find really interesting is in a lot of interviews I get asked, what does your family think of the work you do? So, which to me is very interesting, isn't it? Uh, 
So I don't know if other people get asked that. Emma, do you I want get to get asked, asked that? I get asked that all the time, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, so doesn't that say so much within that one question? So um, there is a lot of pushback, often not verbal, often not direct, but there's a lot of indirect, oh, you're so brave. Oh, what made you do this? You know, as if like the thing I'm doing is like so kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that pushed you? There must be some, I mean, there is trauma in my life, but you know, that's not entirely why I do this work. So the way I kind of look at it is I think people that ask me those questions are still carrying the conditioning that they've carried for those how many generations. They haven't been able to do the work that I've been able to do to kind of do this. So I kind of look at it almost compassionately and I say, well, you know, they haven't grown. So they, they will ask me these questions and I've got to do what I've got to do um, and stay focused. And to me, the best way for me to carry on doing the work is to kind of go quite inward. That's my way. Mm. So I know deep in the pit of my stomach almost why I do this. And it's that voice that speaks uh, and that voice almost isn't Sangeeta's voice. It's, it's, got it, it's got its own momentum and power and uh, confidence. And I kind of let that emerge most of the time. And that kind of does whatever it's going to do, you know? Uh, it I don't know. It it it. No, it is. They're the yeah. alter ego. I do that. We joke and um, we have like ES in the chat for marketing and stuff to do all the business. And I don't see ES as being me. But they could talk about ES being a marketing funnel. You know what I mean? It's just it. That's it, that detachment, isn't it? As you said as well, um, that you you're you're bigger. You know, the purpose is bigger than you as an individual. So if you really strongly believe in what you're doing, then you take that personal attachment out of it because it's the mission is important. So, um, but on the sorry for do you on um on that on that side of things when it comes to sort of you know therapy and seeing clients what are the, the tips um and advice when when you're dealing with like what we've just said and how we do it without really thinking about it the methods we've used <laughs> to, what if, for dealing with imposter syndrome yeah and and that yeah the, the imposter syndrome and also that as we say kind of taking that the personal out of it when you've yeah. got when you believe so strongly in what you're doing um yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, and, you know, I'll just say that's been my experience too, you know, no matter how much I thought I can't do this, you know. I'm, so like I, it sounds silly now, it was 20 years ago I started, but nobody, everybody thought hypnotherapy was a bit weird. Nobody supported me. Nobody thought it was a good idea. Everyone laughed in my face, you know, it was really painful. And I just, there's like an identity change. And I sort of made a promise to my hypnotherapy tutor that I would start. So my fear of letting him down was stronger than my fear of starting. So it kind of drove me to do it. And um, when it started working, I couldn't believe it. And I was so delighted and that sort of carried me through really um so i think that it's really important to notice and acknowledge if you do have this i think you know this whatever your mission is we all have different missions right um i think it's really important to acknowledge it i think if we don't sort of acknowledge and look at and work with our, not our mission our purpose we can get quite depressed actually life can feel quite flat and i think it really needs to be honoured. I think so, you know, sometimes people are at a stage where they don't know what it is or what it could be. And at that point, I said, just be really gentle about it. Just be curious. You know, some people's missions land, you know, minded about when I was about 26, 27. Um, but some people's grows over time. Some people's are born out of the pain and suffering that they've had. Um, some people's comes as ideas. So we've got to be really calm with ourselves and gentle with ourselves about discovering what our mission or our purpose, those things that, you know, make us feel alive, get us out of bed in the morning. Because my, my mission, my purpose is what get, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, a bit later than usual in lockdown. Um, but um, I think it's about giving yourself permission to explore that and know that, you know, if you have this desire to do something and you think, but you, then it's immediately kind of, there's a shame comes with it and you go into this thing like, oh, I can't do that. What would they think? What would aunt person think? And that person from school usually overestimated their interest anyway. I remember being petrified by what an ex-boyfriend might think about me being a hypnotherapist. And a friend said to me, Sammy, I think you've overestimated their interest. I don't care at all. And I think it's a bit weird, but, you know, 
and after a while, who cares? But it's really important to not worry about what people think. It's really important to, you know, what's we go around looking for everyone's approval all the time, but really, even we do get other people's approval, it doesn't really last that long, does it? What matters is our approval for ourselves, and we get that by following through on our intuitions and hunches and I think I can do this I'm terrified I might fail but I think I'm going to have a go anyway because there's this still small voice inside me that's urging me to go for this and I know that I could really help people you've got to follow your passion really so I think it's about really supporting yourself as much as possible if your inner critic your inner voice is like an absolute beast like mine used to be I think it is worth doing some trauma work or some investigative work around that to understand because often that pressure in your head is because there's a lot of unconscious stuff that hasn't been um, fully resolved can we get rid of that inner critic altogether no can we get it right down yes it's possible um like we said the go-to techniques take it off f off not today satan laugh at it sometimes you had the other day it piped up at me on monday when i was really tired and i was like started having a go about everything everything and every single aspect of your life it goes for the whole smorgasbord doesn't it and I went, oh, shut up, I'm just tired, you know. And then I said, need to have a good night's sleep and the next day it's gone, you know. So realise that it's temporary. Um, realise that we're, we're the whole of us. We're not just our achievements, you know. We are the vulnerable parts, the messy parts, the parts that have been traumatised, the angry parts, the shame parts, the parts of us that um, also amazing female leaders, glorious warriors, all of these things. We're all, we're all of that stuff. But expecting us to be just one of them puts too much pressure on the system. And, um, yeah, having a cup of tea with our feelings and just admitting I feel crap today, but this, these feelings aren't facts. And, you know, I sometimes, you know, that saying, feel the fear, do it anyway. Maybe it's also hear the inner voice and do it anyway. Because there's only yeah. somebody the inner voice. And you can't do this. You do it 200 times. It can't really argue with anyone. Yeah. And um, <laughs> finally, the Sarah and Sandita, what, what, are, what would be your takeaway? What Sarah, what's your sort of advice like a couple of a couple of tips of like just of how you deal with it every day that are your go-to um my first one would be to be careful who you're surrounding yourself with it's a bit like you are what you eat you are you are your company um and and the people that you spend the majority of your time with and i think it's really 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 important to have somebody that is supporting you somebody that's cheering you on when that inner critic isn't and that can be yourself as you've said Zoe. But I think also sometimes it's very important to have peer groups and people that you can one aspire to. You know, quite often if I'm feeling really shit, I'll go to Emma Sale's Instagram and see what she's doing, <laughs> and I'll go. It's not me, Nate. You like baby photos of like total yeah. mess. Do you want to say? And look up to somebody that is doing what you aspire to do because you know you we all need role models and i think in the roles that we're yeah. all doing there aren't enough role models for us to look at for examples of, of good good practice so i think that i think the other one is um the the there's another stoicism thing which is amor fati which is you know actually sometimes the obstacle is the way the fear is the thing that you should be challenging and if you can change your mindset see challenges and the negativity and the things that you really don't want to do as actually, I'm going to fucking well do this, and I'm going to do it really damn well. And when I do, I'm going to give myself recognition for doing that. It change if you change your mind into a, I'm going to approach it as an opportunity and be curious, as you said, Zoe. Then I think that massively changes the game, and it changed the game for me. Um, and then finally, there's a really good saying which I like, which is plan as if luck is against you, and execute as if luck is with you. Um, and that's something I use all the time. It's just, if I'm absolutely terrified about doing something, I over prepare. So I'll prepare myself in terms of the, the messages that I tell myself in my head, the research that I'll do for that. And, so, and I'll walk through all the fear setting and visualizing it being a success. All of those things will stack you up so that you feel uber confident. And then if anything does go wrong, you, know, you can just say to yourself, I did the best that I can and that's all right. You know, so, um, and you have to execute it with the courage and the, the confidence of a white middle-aged guy. <laughs> like that. that should be the next slogans on it yeah yeah, Exec, execute, yeah. as if you're a confident yeah. middle-aged white guy yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sandita, what are your what, what are your what's your takeaways before we finish yeah. go to uh, yeah quickly about the middle-aged white guys there was i was i used to work in the corporate world and they always come into a boardroom and have the loudest voices. And I'd always look at them with amazement to say, how are you so sure about what you're saying? And how is the pitch of your voice always so high? Anyway, 
ridiculous. So the two, <laughs> the two things I wanted to say was one's a bit ridiculous and that one's a bit sublime, I think. So one of the things I always do, I, I imagine myself in the future. So there's a future self that I always think of. And I'm wearing this like bright fuchsia suit, right? And I've got gray hair and like this long gray hair and I'm walking and I have this power in my walk. And this future self is just, you know, bright and bubbly and confident and amazing and owns that world. And somehow that always seems to help me. So it's me, but in the future and I've got there and I, you know, I don't feel any, what, what imposter syndrome, you know? So that seems to really help me. And the other thing is um, believing, and maybe it comes from kind of my Hindu faith or upbringing, that we are bigger than this, we are bigger than ourselves. Um, I genuinely feel that the work I do with Soul Sutras is something I was born to do. Like this is why I'm on this planet. Um, and all my life, from the, all the shit that happened has led me to this point where I'm now doing my life's work. And I am convinced of this. And that kind of faith um, of this big purpose lets me go through everything. So I might kind of be on a podium and talking to a lot of people and feeling nervous. But then I remind myself that, hey, I'm, I'm in the right place. This is what I was meant to do. And then somehow that seems to do something to me and channeling that, that bigger purpose and my higher self almost. Um, makes things a lot easier. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Sounds no, like yeah, it does. I've always had a, um, a blind faith. I went to like Church of England school, and and so no, not not it's not necessarily a religious thing. It's it's this faith that it, what's meant to be yeah. will be, and you're and that you're part. You're a tiny cog. That's I always say to people when they go out, you know, get out and walk. But when you get out and walk, I always say it to my husband because he has a habit of like looking down on the ground or he's on his phone. And I'm like, you can't be, you can go for a walk outside for an hour, but if you're looking down at the ground, I'm always like, look up. And if when you look up, you realize actually how irrelevant you are, really, <laughs> in the grand scheme of like of everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that kind of tends for me that puts everything into perspective and makes you realize, well, what am I worrying about? This really silly little thing, really, um, in the big picture of life um but do you know what but thank you guys and i've got to mention forgot to at the beginning um all our webinars are sponsored by gibson's goodology um amazing cbd infused wellness drink that we couldn't ship out to india for some you can have them when you get back and <laughs> yeah. i drank all mine last week so i forgot to save one for this week <laughs> so, yeah, really nice um, I, so I got them yesterday and i stopped myself i had to save one for this because i just because it was so they nice they actually taste really nice don't right. they but um yeah we've got we'll put a discount code out we get 25 percent off so there it is at the bottom if anyone um yeah, if anyone wants to buy them, but thank you guys. That was all. Someone finally, one someone's asked a question. Which Eric Zoe? Which Eric Young book do you recommend? Oh, uh, the first one. How to save your own life and uh, fear of flying. Fear Two of flying. I haven't How read to any. Save of them. your own life is great. It's really good. Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys. That was um, that was brilliant. That was really good. Lovely to meet you all. Yeah. As well. it was really inspiring and really uplifting. <laughs>